What is up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you a special edition of Block Digest on Friday, July 3rd. We have Mr. Alan Pisticello from Blockstream. Um, and I really wish that this was under different circumstances. Uh, gonna have to put you a bit on the hot, speed, or hot seat today. But uh, what's going on, Alan and uh, Janine and Chris? Hey, thanks for having me on. Monkey is not missing in action. So I just want to get this, you know, done with. Um, does grilling you guys about fucking up mean that I'm not going to get my bonus checks for covering block stream stuff from now on? Uh, I think we'll have to see how this goes. But yeah, the the shill status will be in doubt. Shit. Got rent, man. But yeah, you know, um, in, in all seriousness, no. Uh, so let's kind of just dive into it. Um, so, you know, th- this was... Uh, a decent fuck up in terms of the liquid network operated in a manner that it wasn't supposed to. And it caught quite a bit of attention, but, um, I, I know you said before we got going though, um, in the episode where I covered that on the normal show, I didn't quite describe the, the mechanics of the pegging mechanism correctly. So I guess, uh, to kind of frame things properly, you want to break that down and explain how it actually works. Yeah, sure. So uh, there's there's a lot of moving parts in Liquid. First thing, it is a very complicated system, and probably one that I'd say very few people fully understand all the pieces. And and so because of that, like at Blockstream, we have a lot of people who specialize in in parts of this. So I just want to kind of give you the high level overview, uh, just to kind of explain how it how it should have worked, um, and then we can talk about how it deviated from that. Um, so, so just how Liquid works, it's a federated peg from Bitcoin. So what that means is people are going to lock up Bitcoin in a multi-sig uh, script, which is going to be really important to this discussion, that is uh, used, uh, basically the multi-sig is 11 of 15 of the functionaries uh, with an added condition that is intended to be if the network is not operational for a certain amount of period of time or those backup keys that the functionaries have are not able to be restored that they're still not loss of funds. We've seen too many times with, with uh, you know, exchanges where they, they lose their backups or they lose their keys and, and the funds are not recoverable. And so this is something we, we wanted to absolutely not have in liquid, uh, especially in the early days when, you know, it's new and, and unproven. So, so the way it works, you know, someone wants to send money into the network, they can generate an address, which is effectively under the control of those 11 out of 15 functionaries. Uh, and when they do that, the f- uh, funds are now part of the federation. And you you put a corresponding, what's called a claim transaction in on uh, on the liquid side to let the functionaries know that you sent them money. So the, those, those UTXOs kind of gather up as people peg into the network over time. And as those uh, UTXOs are managed, people can do the opposite, which is called a peg out. So someone takes liquid Bitcoin, they send it, uh, they they basically burn that liquid Bitcoin. They, uh, the Federation sees that. Uh, part of that burn transaction says like where it should be sent. The Federation will see that. It will spend some of those UTXOs that were part of the peg in. Uh, and and send that out to whoever wants the money out. So that's that's basically it's you know uh, I think uh, Greg Sanders had this as as like it's a, a fancy um, multi sig bank, uh, which is what you could kind of think of as the the liquid federation in this sense. Uh, it's distributed. There's there's no you know no more than three functionaries in any particular jurisdiction. They're all around the world. Um, we're on you know almost all of the continents actually right now. Uh, I think we're missing Africa and Australia and Antarctica, but um, we're we're pretty spread out, so that means it's very difficult for someone to access this. Um, so we're, we're kind of got into this uh, in terms of what what you said is that you know in terms of the pegging and sweeping. Uh, I think those are minor details, probably just how you assumed it worked. Basically, the transactions are going to be spent by the the federation um, as people are pegging out rather than in. So once it goes in, the federation has control and it can just let it sit there. Um, 
and then one other part of that is if there's not enough peg outs happening to sweep all of the the utxos then the the federation itself should be spending those transactions prior to this uh we use a sequence uh, verify uh, of a uh, timeout period so as long as that timeout period isn't expired the emergency keys can't be used we sweep you know the federation should be sweeping those ahead of that uh time and with enough um gap so that in case there's any kind of like fee event in, in uh, Bitcoin that we that there's a very high likelihood that it would confirm before expiration. Uh, and there's one other part. Uh, the Federation is always aiming to have a target number of UTXOs at any point in time. Um, so that number is roughly uh, 100. Uh, so if it sees that there's too few and it you know, time dispensing, it will split up some of those funds into change addresses. If, if it sees that it's uh, too many, it will uh, consolidate some. So that's also another part of this, and I think uh, plays a factor in, in kind of the behavior and, and what happened. So that was a lot to, to kind of unpack there. Okay, so um, yeah, pretty much like my, I just kind of made a, a wrong assumption in under what conditions and what times it's supposed to sweep something. <clears throat> and it's more of a rather than a, a vacuum sucking things in it's more of a kind of a vacuum sucking things in and spitting things out like that balance between ensuring that that time lock never expires without network failure is related to flows in both direction not just the flows in yeah exactly if there's a lot of uh, transactions coming in you know that's a lot of new utxos that will likely need to get consolidated uh when there's a, a spend and then there's if there's a lot of peg outs uh most of those will result in change and, and and not really disrupt that but they will end up recycling some of this so again if you're looking at um 100 utxos targeted and it's on average i mean it could be more it could be less given conditions uh it's pretty considerable amount of um activity that would be needed to automatically spend that on its own. And again, like, um, you know, during the early days of the network, that's not going to be that significant. There's not a lot of outflows of the network. It's, it's mostly inflows we've seen. Um, and, 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 you know, there are, you know, just Blockstream as part of our, uh, as being a service provider for the liquid network, we run um, testing on the network to ensure things are working properly. So we have like a daily peg in and peg out. So anyone who's, Who's kind of monitoring that? Um, you know, monitoring the liquid wallet. They can see that there's you know a thousandth of a Bitcoin being put in and put out every every day on the network, and that's really just kind of for our monitoring purposes. But but it, like that's that's not enough to spend a hundred UTXOs reliably. And the other purpose, when we do pegouts, the UTXOs are not really um, spent based on age; they're spent just randomly. So um, you know, you could just get bad luck, even if you were just relying on the pegout mechanism, where you know you. You have 10,000 pegouts, but maybe one just never got chosen. Uh, one of the UTXOs never got chosen uh, and and could expire if there's not automatic sweeping. Okay, and so that was the, the whole logic for having some kind of behavior function to just check and sweep um, when you get close to the, the time. So I guess, uh, yeah, you know, I, th I think here's a good place. Um, like what, what exactly went wrong here? where it was causing sometimes um, those UTXOs to be sweeped just after the time lock expired rather than before. Yeah, sure. So so the, this all comes back to one um, mistake uh, that happened at the launch of the network. So uh, we, we had a liquid test network where we were just operating it on our own just for people to test and integrate. Uh, and the time lock on that was set to four, uh, 2000 and... Uh, 16 blocks, which is about um, 14 days. It's a pretty short period of time for, for this. Uh, so we had all our code set up. We had our test network all running, and we're getting ready to launch the network, and we're trying to decide on what those parameters sh should be. Um, and, you know, the, the error of it's a new network. No one knows what's going to happen. No one knows how these functionaries are going to be able to keep their servers up or if they're going to be responsive or responsible in keeping backups. So we chose a day, you know, we chose uh, a four week time period, which is 4,032 blocks uh, as just kind of an arbitrary number of that's the most amount of time it would take to get all the funds out of liquid with the emergency keys if something happened. Uh, looking back in hindsight, it probably should have been a bigger number. We probably should have been higher, but, but 
given that Liquid hadn't launched and we'd never had anyone running a functionary other than Blockstream before that, uh, we, we erred on the side of caution. Um, unfortunately, what did happen, uh, and this, this kind of goes into the understanding of how Liquid works, Liquid functionaries really have two parts. One is just kind of like a stock off-the-shelf server, high-performance server that's running Liquid nodes and running Bitcoin nodes. It knows how to construct transactions. It's very powerful. Um, but because it's connected to the internet and it's it's doing a lot of things, it's it, it has a bigger attack surface. Uh, whereas the HSM is a, is a subcomponent on here, which is communicating with the the server over a serial line, which is very limited in terms of what kind of communications are going in and out. So it's it's very would be very hard to attack that particular aspect uh, remotely. So that that HSM is is responsible for signing Bitcoin transactions. It has the and also signing liquid blocks and it has rules about it. So the, one of the rules for the liquid blocks is it doesn't allow uh, reorganizations of the chain more than one block. And on the Bitcoin side, it's making sure that all of the money that it's signing is either going back to itself as change, itself being the whole federation, uh, or the uh, or that the um, funds are going to a, one of the uh, whitelisted parties. And uh, you know currently there's. For pegouts, it is only going to a whitelist. I would love to expand that in the future, and we have uh, some ideas on how to do that. But just for simplicity, um, you know, it's just checking to see if it's a whitelist. So this ensures that even if those functionaries, and that would take hacking uh, 11 of these around the world um, to do that, to pull that off, the worst it could do is it could try to get a signature from the, the functionary, I'm sorry, from the HSM, which would only sign things to go to the Federation itself, which no big deal if it pays itself or to a whitelisted ad, uh, address of someone that, you know, if, if someone hacked it and, and sent it to them, it'd be very clear. Um, they would, they, they have an obligation to return those funds if they weren't, uh, uh, you know, authorized, if they weren't their own. Uh, so what happened was the HSM's logic for what is my own address didn't deviate from, uh, it didn't make that change. So it was still stuck on the two week time interval Whereas the functionary server, which is the one creating the transactions, was still on the four week, uh, 4032 block cycle. So what happened was when, when Liquid launched, they disagreed and the HSMs refused to sign transactions because they saw the change going back to what they it thought was an unknown address. It didn't, it didn't understand that it was actually the correct address. Uh, so to get around this, um, and one other thing to keep in mind, the, the functionaries are designed to be updated. Um, not super easy to update. It does require physical access for the operator to go get to it and um, physically access it to to do any kind of updates. Whereas the HSM is really not intended to be updated at all, and it, it takes uh, considerably more effort to do this. It's possible, um, but it, it, it's 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 not something that we would expect um, normal operators to do this. So since we can't change the, the HSMs very easily, what we can change was the uh, functionary. So the functionary would just, uh, even though the pegans would be using this four week timeout, the functionary would request change to the two week time period uh, instead. So this is where it was kind of had some special off logic on this. Um, so by around this time also, we're also realizing that, you know, sweeping is not sufficient. The liquid network is, Pretty insignificant at this time. I think we're 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 talking under 50 Bitcoin, um, and again, that 50 Bitcoin is split among 100 UTXOs, uh, and so we 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 implement the sweep logic to force this to happen. The sweep logic looked at the code on the functionary and says whatever the period is, divide it by two, spend it halfway through the period, uh, uh, so that we have roughly two weeks for it to not expire. Uh, and this is again kind of goes into specialization. Um, it was the functionary code itself is using its numbers. HSM was using its numbers. So the sweep logic was out of sync with what uh, was actually going on with with uh, what, what reality is of those things. So that's why it looked like it was spending it immediately after, um, after the timeout, which is half of the intended period. Uh, so it was waiting until 1,016 blocks had gone by. The next function uh, round, watchman round, those happen every roughly 20 minutes or so, uh, happened and it spends the funds and it takes, you know, some amount of time for those uh, to confirm. So again, this is liquid small. The amount that's expiring is is relatively small. 
over any period of time, you know, half of a Bitcoin at any point in time. Uh, the keys, I guess, probably worth talking about the emergency keys. Those are something that were, uh, you know, three parts of them spread all around the world, stuck in uh, cold storage where it would take, you know, many days to be able to get to these things, even if we needed to. So, so realistically, from from an internal side of the risk, it, it was it was quite small. Uh, of course, coming from the outside perspective, no one knows anything and has to rely on, you know, what is Blockstream doing with those keys, and what is the worst thing that could happen, and 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 that's something where, uh, once we noticed that that they were out of sync, it would have made a lot of sense to to do that earlier. Okay, so pretty much, um, you know, to sum up, I guess, in simpleton terms. Uh... Like you guys picked a a poorly chosen variable, um, which was then baked into the actual hardware security module on network launch, and that really didn't sync with the actual reality of ins and outflows with the network early on. And so, when it came to the patching, you had to pretty much hack um, a patch for the the server side of this. Um, and the only way really to patch the HSM side is replace them and then enter coronavirus and global lockdowns and shipping disruption, yada, yada. Exactly. So, so this kind of goes back into our, our, our bigger term plans of, of releasing something called dynamic. Right now, Liquid is very static. Um, it's impossible to change those emergency keys out without updating the HSM. It's impossible to update the HSM software without taking the thing apart and re-imaging it. Uh, it's, and you want to get the old keys back for it. So it's, it's a, you know, it's quite a process uh, to do this. Um, so we needed, we wanted to get the animations uh, in place. Uh, we do have plans to create new HSMs as well with uh, more uh, and power uh, on them as well so they can do more evaluation but that's also another quite uh long project given that it's uh you know novel hardware being being generated uh so our plan is to to, to upgrade the existing hsms in the field and uh as part of the process you know that's something that we you know originally thought might be able to be done pretty soon after um after the after we found the problem so it was one of those things we could shrink the time to sweep every seven days and uh obviously the you're sweeping transactions more often um and you're you know seven of the block or block uh, transaction to confirm is not quite as good as having 14 days uh, so yeah we, we, we were planning to do this as part of dynafed dynamic federations lets you switch functionaries in and out so let's just say one of the if one of the functionary companies that was in liquid went out of business right now we'd have to make sure that they save their backups and maybe a company in a bankruptcy doesn't do that well and that leaves it where we have 14 functions you know, and handle some all that. right can, can we hold on a second um i'm gonna i'm gonna kill my vpn real quick because it's my connection starting to get kind of patchy you know what i mean Sorry, just one second. All right, so uh, sorry about the uh, the hard cut in the recording there. Uh, some connection issues on my end, but uh, you want to pick that back up, Alan? Yeah. So, so our big uh, next milestone for Liquid will be the dynamic federation. So the idea is being able to change any parameter so long as the federation, a uh, four fifths majority of them, uh, agree on it. Um, so what this means is, you know, if they want to add functionaries, let's just say there's new people who want to join the network, let's just say there's someone who goes out of business and you want to remove them, um, that that's possible. And of course, this also lets you do things like change the emergency keys. So, you know, initially we generated them and uh, I'd love to have third parties hold these keys, um, but it's one of those things where it's hard to explain when Liquid's not live. As Liquid matures, I think it makes a lot more sense to distribute those between more entities. Uh, and those keys can be changed out and replaced, or the time period can be changed. So this is that was our opportunity to really fix this in the most clean way possible. Um, now, reality is uh, sometimes it's it's worth doing things a little unclean, uh, and that's where it comes into, you know, was it the right time to wait or not? So, so yeah, COVID and all that. We're planning to do the the upgrade of the HSMs, um, literally supposed to be planned in the in the spring of this year. 
and COVID breaks out. And our original plan was to actually have Blockstream engineers apply this fix to as many of these as possible and have some self-service kits uh, in case we were unable to get to them. And it's become a lot more challenging, uh, as you might notice. So we've, we've actually gotten these updates in place uh, on, on three of them right now. Um, with the plans to start start getting more as these lockdowns uh, go down, but that's also kind of, you know, in hindsight, it's a little easier to say we should have taken the the quick fix of uh, just sweeping them more often. Uh, but but this will get us a better behavior even in the long run, even with this fix of having a longer time period um, possible. Yeah, and so I mean, you know, just to to kind of be harsh, I mean, eh, and blunt for a second. You know, it's like this was part of the the threat model um, within which the whole consensus process is set up, like just properly balancing known entities with reputations and legal accountability. And, you know, it, you guys fucked up in how you balance things initially. And, you know, it just goes to show that when you have this kind of consensus system or trust model, that it really is kind of dependent on the larger geopolitical state of things. Like, you know what I mean? Like this, you know, was a known issue, as you guys said in the disclosure, and you were in the process of planning out a long-term solution, and then a pandemic happens. And while in the grand scheme of things, you know, like you said, um, the the real risk of any money being stolen because of this was very low, it, it was still a deviation from the intended consensus project or process and, you know, operation mode. And yeah, you know, I, I personally think that the dam or dynamic foundation or wow. Okay, the fact that I only got like five hours of sleep is starting to show. But um, <laughs> I think the Dynamic Federation is a, a very elegant long-term solution to this. But, you know, it just goes to show a consensus model like this is something that needs to evolve. Like, this isn't like proof of work where there are underlying axiomatic assumptions. You hit start and it just goes and we just see if it fails or not we just have to hope it doesn't like this is something that needs to evolve dynamically and be able to adapt to changes in those larger geopolitical circumstances yeah i think that's fair i think i think as we see um you know, liquid evolve, you know at the very beginning days very few people are using it very few people know about it no one's investigating it. No one's looking at it. Um, and there's no, there's little risk because you know, if there's little use or little funds that risk, uh, you know, not much can happen. That's bad. Um, it's embarrassing if something bad happens then, but, but from a realistic standpoint, you know, when there's five Bitcoin in the network, yeah, that's embarrassing, but we've spent way more than that building the system in terms of engineer efforts and, and, you know, could easily repay, Law for losses if there was something like that. Um, whereas if the system we're at now uh, and we're starting to see it grow, it's you know at you know over two thousand Bitcoin in the network. Uh, that's a much different system, uh, and and I think we're starting to see that uh, maturity come into play. And I, one thing we didn't mention so far was um, the establishment of uh, some federation boards that happened last year. We had we we had a liquid federation meeting in in Japan. Um, and we talked about governance of the network and really how the Federation itself could take more of an involvement uh, and oversight rather than it just being Blockstream. Uh, this was never intended to be uh, controlled by Blockstream or Blockstream's uh, thing. It's mostly that we are a service provider to this. We have a lot of expertise on how it works. And theoretically, if we did a bad job, the Federation uh, could fire us and replace us with a different service provider. We provide the source for what they need. Um, there's no requirement they use our HSMs. They could they could use their own or build their own or go without an HSM if they wanted to. And so this is really what we're seeing with the, you know, as the network's growing. Um, no one 
outside of, of the Federation or in Blockstream was really looking at these types of vulnerabilities until recently. And so that's, that's what I think what came up. Um, you know, we're starting to get more of a, a target on our back and that's, that's, you know, a good thing. If, if no one cared about you, you're not really doing much. Uh, and so that's why we're going to start seeing, uh, I think this is only the beginning of it. Uh, people, you know, we've, we've had, and we've had independent people bring us, you know, security issues that we've patched, you know, in the past, um, using responsible disclosure, and and that's been good. But we're going to start seeing more of these, um, you know, looking to get egg on Blockstream or looking to attack Liquid, where the first the first that it's ever disclosed is just out on Twitter, um, and and I think that that's you know we should expect that and we should pre be prepared for that and we need to start treating this network um, with with enough. Um, you know, security mindset and disclosure to the Federation that, that, that that's to be expected and it doesn't really have any uh, effect on things. So, so yeah, we got to step our game. We're at, we're, it's, it's kind of a sign to me that we're at, we're, we're kind of hitting that inflection point where it's not just blocks. Like at the first part, it's just Blockstream cares about it. Second part, the Federation starts caring about it more and more. And then the third part, you start seeing outsiders starting to care about it. So I think, I think we're getting there and that's, um, it's a good thing, but we also need to step up our game from it. Yeah, you know, that that's kind of like an interesting aspect that honestly I haven't really followed or gone into uh personally in depth at all. Like the the Federation board that was established. Because you know, I, I saw the the initial meeting in Japan um had taken place and that the the group had been created, but I don't really know much about like the the structure of it and kind of like how like how how are the members of that board um looking at that that board in terms of an organization like how are they trying to get involved like what are what are their thoughts um you know anything that they wouldn't mind uh being discussed publicly regarding where they want to take things yeah so so there's three um different boards part of the the federation governance um the first one is the oversight board um which really kind of helps decide how to to you know how the governance process should work uh of of the federation they're very involved in that also kind of just general promotion of the network or coordination efforts there uh, then there's another board called the membership board which deals with uh you know deciding who would be uh able to join the federation or not so they collect information from uh, people interested in joining do some vetting, making sure their security practices are, are up to par, and uh, brings that to the to greater federation uh, to to add or uh, add those members, or if if needed, remove them. Uh, and then the last one is the technology board, which is reviewing the 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 uh, roadmap and also being involved in um, having a central way to kind of propose changes to the network and and get their feedback or um, uh, buy-in on this before it goes out to the rest of the Federation. So this has really been our opportunity to to um, expand the role of those boards. Um, you know, as this patch went out, uh, it went through the technology board and that was kind of a first step on that. It's, and, you know, it's, it's really showing it's the Federation is taking this ownership on. Um, there's still a lot of reliance on you know, Blockstream is being technical experts in this. Not, not everyone in these companies are, are are going to be as knowledgeable about what's going on in Liquid, but they are smart um, people who understand the basics of it and can poke and prod and ask questions about this. So, yeah, the more the more oversight we see from from the Federation and taking ownership of this, uh, I think it's going to really look like more of an industry uh, product um, more than a Blockstream product. Yeah, and it's you know the. Like the kind of thing, like with these different boards, the way you broke them down, I'm wondering is, like, what what kind of like overlap or or um a lack of an overlap, let's say in terms of different uh, federation members are there for each of these boards, because you know it really seems like this is kind of trying to specialize the different, I don't know, stack layers of of the network and all the participants. And, you know, that seems like a lot for every member to be fully involved in each of the individual boards. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so the boards are set up to have um, five members each and, and uh, the board or the, the federation as part of the, the original governance meeting kind of decided that there shouldn't be someone on the oversight board and 
uh, any other board. So you could be on the membership and the technology one, but it was a little too, uh, there's a concern there might be too much power of the oversight board for someone to be there and someone else. So, you know, we have 15 seats. Some of them, you know, some companies are on, have uh, have a member on two seats, uh, two of the boards, um, but it's pretty spread out in terms of that. And, and the federation boards can, uh, you know, are reporting back to the rest of the federation that don't necessarily have members in there. And this was, this is an election process where, you know, the, each member had a vote, um, to, to put for this, uh, and, and selected one of the, you know, the people who, who were wanting to run for it. And, uh, the top five vote getters were the ones who were selected. Okay. So you're, you're actually rather, all of you are actually trying to have kind of a, a thought through like checks and balance system. That's, I, I don't want to say democracy uh, because of all the stupid connotations of that, but kind of like democratically rotate people through different boards and positions there and kind of make sure it's, it's not ripe for like a, a few members just dominating all of the different boards. Yeah, exactly. So there's, you know, again, the impact of one, they can't stack one particular board or even even be on all of them right now. And of course, it's up to the oversight committee to kind of set those rules. We 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 expect it to evolve with time. Um, that that initial rule maybe maybe was too strict. Um, we we had actually um, fewer people want to go for the oversight committee because they wanted to kind of go for the other boards, and they didn't want to limit themselves. So you know, I think it's going to evolve with time. Uh, it's going to evolve with um, how um, you know the processes of, of, of how this, how these things evolve. And ultimately a lot of this, this stuff really does come down to the functionaries in the end, because the functionaries are the ones running the code when dynamic federation, they are the ones who add the new members to that white list. Um, if two thirds of them don't agree on things, uh, then it won't move forward. So the boards are kind of just, you know, one way to kind of manage the process and, and make it easy to, uh, to, you know, coordinate it's more of like a coordination problem um rather than a power thing so i think that's that's the other way to look at it is they're they're not they're not like some powerful entity um it, it all has to get approved by the federation anyway um now they just may they can choose to just go with whatever they say or they could choose to be you know you know try to veto that if they needed to so it's a very um you know hard system to 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 change uh, unless there's agreement. So I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, uh, Chris, uh, Janine, uh, either you, you know, got anything you want to kind of get into regarding these boards and the, uh, the kind of incentive structure and stuff here. I mean, I'm good from my end. I don't know. I guess, uh, yeah, you know, one, one thing I kind of wanted to, to bring up and touch on, uh, during this part of things, Alan is whiz. <laughs> um, and the the fact that he he was actually allowed to to join um, this network and you know be authorized as a participant that can peg people out of it and you know what I mean I love that on a personal level but it also is just kind of like how did that happen like how did the these companies that that made up the federation previously decide to just let this this cypherpunk um, individual into that membership. Yeah, so I mean, technically, it is not Wiz the person in. It is Wiz has a it was a company that that is doing uh, Bitcoin services. So um, in terms okay. of in terms of doing that, yeah, I mean, he applied with his company uh, to join. Um, there is a federation charter that 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 members are um, you know the, the oversight board came up with and. Um, and basically that's what they require um, members to, to sign. And so it's basically, um, it's been a while since I've looked at it, but, you know, basically they're not going to use the network for bad purposes or try to harm it in any way. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like as, as far as providing a service to the network, um, 
I, I don't want to speak too much to anything he, he hasn't disclosed publicly, and I don't know what he has or hasn't. Um, but in general, he's looking to build services on top of uh, Liquid and make it more accessible. So I know, like I know, uh, he's helped with the BISC integration. Uh, that's been one thing. So again, he's he's adding value to the network, and I think the Federation appreciates that. Um, and it's up to them to to decide. So you know who is is that sufficient? Do we need anything more? And, and again, I think also also the risk, right? So the risk of the, as as a member. Um, to the Federation really is. He gets a vote now uh, and he has a pack entry to be on that white list. So um, it's, it is a kind of last ditch security effort, that white list. It's not, it's not the main security um, that we have built into liquid, but it is something, um, but it would take a pretty substantial effort to, to even, you know, include with him to, to do anything kind of evil with the network. So it's just kind of like one of those things where it's like a low risk, high reward situation of, of adding uh adding to the network yeah because it's you know um one of the things that is kind of like that um you know whiz being brought into the federation that really made me start thinking about is the like how dynamic will the federation be as it continues to grow like how how willing will the 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 federation be as a whole to bring in new members uh, like Wiz. I mean, you know what I mean? Like he he is a, a straight up cypherpunk. Like he is trying to build Bitcoin services and stuff as cypherpunks would want to. And, you know, I'm, I'm just, it's just kind of, I like I can't personally decide which way I see that going. Like that maintaining that kind of, dynamic willingness to let a participant like that in or if things will kind of ossify and the federation be very hesitant to let any member in who would be from a, a legacy point of view uh, a risk you know what i mean yeah it's uh, federations are, are certainly um interesting i mean even if you look at um i'm just gonna use this as an example you could have let's just say liquid is is evolved and now be you know the technology behind liquid is is used for um banks to do some type of settlement between them and you might have a situation where like you know five of the big banks get together but they're they don't want wells fargo in for whatever reason and there's always someone who doesn't want someone you know there's someone that's not deemed good enough to get in and there's always someone who thinks that they're too good to be associated with these people so it's kind of it's kind of weird at both both extremes of uh, uh what you get here so i think you know what will we see with liquid um hard to tell i mean it may be the situation where you know it specializes in kind of one one niche area and there's maybe another federation that's needed for different purposes with different members that feel more comfortable uh, around each other. Maybe you have a federation that's just Swiss regulated entities because they feel comfortable with that. And that that's just how that one works. It doesn't have to be one federation. And, and you know, as a user, you can trust who, whichever federation you want or, or none at all. Like this isn't trying to replace Bitcoin. It's not trying to, um, it's not trying to, 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 to do anything. It's just trying to make, the um, the the existing custodial models more secure. So I mean, everyone right now has money on an exchange or is, that's trading is moving it back and forth. There's a lot of trust already of those exchanges. It's not really a change of that model. You're not hodling your money on on liquid. That's not that's not the intent. So again, who you can choose to do business with with who you want, and it may be lots of federations. Um, there may be one, you know, there is a, uh, you know, big network effect of having one big federation where it's, it, it can, might be costly and it just, there's a lot of integration points around that. And, um, it would have to be a pretty substantial, you know, once we get to that point, it might be really hard to do a new federation and then maybe, you know, you know, Goldman Sachs joins liquid or something crazy like that could happen or the, you know, the federal reserve or something joins liquid. I mean, that would be crazy right now thinking about it, but, but who knows, or maybe it will be a separate federation. Okay. So this, I think, um, is where I'm going to springboard into autist land. Um, I guess just to keep things sane, uh, 
I don't know, I'll start with liquid itself and what that can be. And then after that, we can go into what you can do on liquid. But, um, you know, you're speaking of multiple federations. Um, ever since Blockstream first uh, published the, the concept of dynamic federations and announced that was on the roadmap, um, my brain immediately took the federation set that is in charge of sidechain consensus and the federation set that is custodying coins in the main chain and ripped them apart and went, why the hell do these things have to overlap 100%? Um, and, you know, with, with the kinds of changes you guys are trying to roll out to the HSMs right now to enable that, um, in, in the really long term, um, I see some crazy system evolving that I think people have a hard time conceptualizing right now. You could have 200 people involved in a single federation set as far as block signing on the liquid sidechain. And you could have 150 different non-overlapping sub-federations that handled pegging Bitcoin into liquid. And that is as easy to represent on the sidechain as create a new asset. And people can distinguish when interacting with that who is actually custodying it on the main chain and who they're trusting there. Like that, the, the entire protocol for dynamic federations, it enables a crazy amount of dynamism beyond just add and remove participants. Like you can completely separate the, the bucket of participants arbitrarily however you want. So actually, yeah, what you're saying is actually not even possible today. Um, and actually, um, you know, there's been interest in this as well. So let's say you just do not trust the, the functionaries that are there today, but there was a different federation that you do trust. Um, and what you could do is you could have a separate peg that's Bitcoin in liquid issue as another asset run by that federation. And as far as most users liquid concerned, they don't even know this thing exists. They just know there's some asset out there. They don't have to know the supply of it. They could just based on how liquid works. Uh, but there could be multiple Bitcoins on, um, on the network. And, and the Federation really has, you know, the most power they have is really with point because they do have that 11 of 15 that if they, you know, got extracted keys from their HSM and things like that, they, you know, could access. Uh, but if you have, just in terms of block signing, the only power they really have is they could make chain forks. And that's very provable that that happened. If you have two competing chains that anyone ever detects, it's very good proof that the Federation was, was um, you know, not, not doing what they're supposed to be doing. But that underlying Bitcoin, they have no control over it for a separate peg, or if there's a separate Federation to do this. Uh, so this is exactly what we're seeing already with also with altcoins as well. Um, I, I, I don't know if anyone's monitoring the, the asset registry, but but there's been a couple of, uh, you know, added assets for like an Ethereum peg and a Tezos clay peg. And I think even there was a BCH peg early on someone made and it's just independently operated. And it might be, you know, one guy that just does it um, or one company, which I think is kind of similar to what a lot of these wrapped um, assets are on Ethereum. It's one company that just just manages this peg. They just hold an underlying asset, or it could be very big multi-sig federations that are holding this. Um, and again, if you want to have Bitcoin held by only cypherpunks that you don't know who they are, um, and there's 200 of them, great, you can do that, and they could make their own liquid asset for it. If you want to have it only where it's you know Swiss regulated, you know banks or, or other companies that hold these assets and they make their own token and you can only interact with that one if you want to so this is already already possible today obviously the the mechanism for monitoring and updating the asset is is something someone has to build um but it's 100 percent entirely possible right now yeah and so it's like you know th th this is kind of where i have seen liquid going in the long term if it succeeds for a while like it's it's not 
really a tenable thing at a global scale to just have this single static well single group that is changed um correspondingly in sync like that can just completely separate and silo and spread the risk around and you know where where i see liquid going if it succeeds is becoming the rails for things like the nasdaq like trusted settlement systems that don't want to deal with liquidity constraints of other um, trustless layers and if you don't really abstract and spread that risk around and and decompose the the consensus model like this then that is a massive single point of failure that if successful could represent you know mind-boggling percentages of value in the economy yeah i think i think that's one thing you know um there's a lot of confusion i think in the in the marketplace right now about like what what problem liquid's trying to solve and 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 why why it matters to bitcoiners uh and really what i what i think is 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 why it matters is there there will always be other assets that are being traded around the world um and this doesn't even go into like bitcoin versus shitcoin like this is like there's going to be stocks, there's going to be bonds, there's going to be debt, there's going to be all of these tradable instruments that exist, and they're not competing with Bitcoin. They are completely different. Um, even in a world where there is no no fiat, um, that's where you have you know some something you're going to need to settle with. You know so you're going to want to have some base currency um, that is that is kind of providing liquidity for all these things, and that's where. Our, Bitcoin really has a chance to shine. Um, right now, kind of the dollar is the the standard for a lot of this right now. Um, as we've seen, you know, even this year, just massive amounts of money printing going on. Is that something that's going to be stable globally long term as a settlement layer for the financial system? And uh, I don't think it has a you know unlimited lifetime on that. I think that that, that will expire. Uh, and the question is, will Bitcoin be ready to to be that replacement, or will there be some other fiat iteration that happens before we get to Bitcoin? Uh, and so, having Bitcoin as the you know native asset there, where there's just such better trust models than you have with 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 something like fiat, um, even with this, these like federated systems, you could have every you know settlement of every piece of stock. You know the whole system right now. If anyone knows how it works, it's just an absolute nightmare and mess of, of of how the settlement process works, where people can make trades with things they don't have. Um, this whole system solves that, uh, where where you you guarantee that when you're giving up what you you want to give up, whether it's you know the financial instrument or Bitcoin, you're getting exactly what um, what you expect, and that settlement happens you know within minutes, not within you know multiple days uh, or relying on trusted third parties to do all this. So this is something that, that really has the, the potential to to spread far beyond the Bitcoin ecosystem, but also make Bitcoin a key part of it. And so that's 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 what's interesting to me. And I think a lot of a lot of Bitcoiners miss is um, I want Bitcoin to be widely used as, you know, become the global world reserve currency. I think that's that's something it has the potential to be and and is just fantastic because it doesn't rely on any you know any set of people in power any um, particular nation um, to that can destroy it and we've seen you know if you have the power to benefit yourself or your protect you know the people that are uh, close to you or, or you know powerful interests uh, with these currencies that are controlled by man it happens uh, whereas Bitcoin, that can't can't happen, uh, at least not if we're vigilant. So that's that's something where where I think building these these products, um, you know, you have to be thinking way in the future um, for how that might fit together to to really kind of see it. But but once you do, um, that that's really the long term goal and kind of the play we're going for here at uh, Blockstream is really, you know, re uh, reinventing the whole financial system. Um, with Bitcoin being the key parts, you know, centerpiece of it. Yeah, because it's you know like the 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 
use case being sold right now with liquid directly to people in this ecosystem it's it's as simple as just faster arbitrage trading and that's a very useful thing in terms of just improving the experience for traders if they're okay with that trust change and just pulling that off of the main chain so that it scales better for other use cases and you know that also goes into the otc stuff um i think can be a very interesting environment for in terms of disintermediating a lot of the trust in an otc trade but yeah i am just like in my mind it is a an equity settlement system potentially it is the thing that everybody issues their stocks on rather than the nasdaq and yeah like it's it's not even entirely in my mind um the settlement efficiency of those equities themselves that is a big selling point in my mind it's just guaranteeing that the interaction between that other asset and bitcoin that exchange is atomic like for whoever is getting bitcoin that is very close to trustless and you know that just is a whole different game in terms of the people holding those equities can't shuffle or like losses off on people other than them like they can't try to claw things back or have money frozen or enter legal dispute it's it's the bitcoin has changed hand like that that's, risk is yours now it's even worse than that because you know even with stock um no one knows like people there, there's I think there, I've seen multiple times with companies where, where more people think they own the stock than there are shares issued. So there's, you know, it's just, it's just not, there's not even any tracking of, of like multiple people owning the same shares and they think they haven't promised them. Like with this situation, you, 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 you can see it that you, you have those assets and that's it. Like you're getting a real asset. It's not just someone's promise and everything right now is just every time it's like falling apart. Like we used to have, paper shares of stock and then like couriers were going around New York and carrying bags of, you know, checks or, or bags of uh, shares and all this. And it just keeps getting more centralized and centralized and centralized and rely on more and more thirties um, that have to be trusted to do this. And you have to go through a broker that goes through the, you know, his broker, and then it goes through this you know central settlement system. And there's just so many layers of it. And of course that's, that's expensive and, error prone it leaves a lot of mistakes so i think this is like far more than just the atomic swap that's that's one piece of this right now like you can do trades on like no one knows who owns it so like if if you're a big trader out on there and you're one of the authorized parties you say like yeah i have you know 10,000 apple shares why don't i'm gonna sell them to you and if you don't have them like there's nothing like you have to just deal with it in court or they get fined or they get you know pay have to pay money into this so it's just a really it's a really inefficient system but given the limitations of uh you know technology and things like that this is pre pre-computers even being being used um it's it's understandable why it's that way but we can do better now and i think that's where it is and throwing bitcoin in there in the mix uh, just is another massive uh bonus bonus i think th that we can have yeah all right i think here let's uh Let's shift gears a little bit uh, and talk more. What what can you really build on Liquid in terms of science experiments? So uh, Janine, uh, I think you had a, a question about a potential thing that could be done there. Yeah, because um, I I only follow Liquid stuff very lightly, and mainly I'm interested in the fact that you guys have implemented confidential transactions because I feel like that's an important thing for systems other than Bitcoin to be trying out certain things and finding holes in them and things to upgrade before they get added to Bitcoin. And uh, one of the other things I was thinking about yesterday due to a, uh, a request from the IRS uh, for information that they put out, um, basically saying, we want people to help us uh, track not only privacy coins, but lightning 
and also uh, they called it tracing challenges that would come with uh, Schnorr signatures, which I thought was interesting that they were even aware of that. Um, and I was kind of curious if uh, if Schnorr signatures is on the development map at all in terms of adding it to Liquid. Sorry, you uh, cut out right at the end. You said about Schnorr being adding it to Liquid. Is that was that what the question was? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so this is something you know, Tapper, Schnorr, all these things are things we want to add to Liquid. Um, you know, I, I, one of the the kind of benefits of of Elements in general, Elements is the code base behind Liquid, and you can make your own Elements, you know, instance and and basically be a, be like Liquid of your own with it. Is that we can have all these uh, features in uh, ahead of Bitcoin um to try out so so like something like segwit we actually implemented in elements prior to um bitcoin um and so something like schnorr and taproot uh you know these are things we're looking at in here uh, another thing not mentioned was uh, simplicity so simplicity is the uh, smart contracting language that that will basically let you um add more functionality to bitcoin without actually requiring any types of uh, forks or anything like that so you know, these are all all big things, and again, confidential transactions. Um, those are just massive um, wins for 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 privacy. Um, you know, just to give everyone a kind of a quick overview, of confidential transactions. Uh, if you go to blockstream.info and go to the Liquid Explorer, if you go dig into the transactions, um, there's very few that you can actually see much going on. You see addresses in and addresses out. Uh, but you have no idea what asset it is or or how much of it is being transferred. Uh, so that really, really, um, you know, helps protect a lot of um, use cases. So a couple of those that are really important. If I'm trading, I'm sending money to an exchange. Uh, I'm sure everyone who's listening to this has, you know, seen whale alerts and all that. Like, you can see that there is money going to that exchange. It takes time to confirm people will trade against you and you will lose money you know, if, if they can guess your intent. Um, the other aspect of privacy is if, if I'm making a Bitcoin payment from, from me to you and I use a UTXO that has a um, you know, large value and I give myself change, well, someone else knows not only, not only do they know that I, that I control a large amount of Bitcoin, they know exactly what address it's in and can kind of follow that and maybe gain some more information on this. So there's, there's a lot of um, benefits that you get from, from confidential transactions. And, and yeah, I think, I think a uh, funny thing is, you know, people are, are concerned about are the big institutions going to be turned off of liquid because of this. And it's actually the opposite. Um, they wouldn't consider using a system where, you know, their competitors could spy on them and know exactly what they're doing or how much of a position they hold. Uh, so that's something that's that's really important, um, not just in Bitcoin, but outside in, in just the traditional financial space. And that's that's why we've built it in. Um, does that some some complexity to it, but uh, it makes the transactions bigger as well. But but I think for specialized use cases, it's uh, it's nice to have that option available. Uh, and as we optimize it and get it get it better and the tech more proven, maybe it can be more incorporated into Bitcoin. You guys have any kind of like a timetable or uh, things on the roadmap as far as uh, Schnorr? Like I know it's probably uh, if you do pushed back because of the whole. Uh, snafu with the the timeout issue. Actually, the timeout issue was pretty uh, didn't really have too much of an effect on this. We we got that out pretty quickly, and it's actually deployed already, um, and and pretty much resolved. Uh, we'd like to get all the functionaries updated, but we only need five. Uh, once we get five, it's uh, sufficient for every case that that would be able to protect it. So that actually didn't didn't hurt too much. Um, as for Schnorr, I. Um, I don't, I wish I had better information. I know, I know we've been looking at it and just in terms of rebasing it from what, you know, the code for Schnorr is, is done and on the Bitcoin side, or at least ready for review. Um, so in that case, we could start pulling that in, but I think there's some complications with it just because of, um, you know, take, take a little bit more work where it's just not going to be a smooth, um, you know, merging things down, but, but it is on our roadmap, um, especially as we start, you know, we we keep elements uh, up to date with uh, Bitcoin as much as we can. We're you know a couple versions back right now, uh, but we we we've got it set up so we can rebase and we'll we'll be continuing to rebase it with with new versions of Bitcoin. So it, it will eventually um, it'll eventually make it into Liquid. I don't have an exact timetable on that though. 
you know that the minute we're done with this show, I'm going to have to rush off and make a meme about the main chain racing liquid to get Schnorr in, right? <laughs> yeah, so that's actually, that's actually kind of a lesson we learned, too, with uh, Segwit. We, we put Segwit in elements first. Um, and then Bitcoin itself, the, the actual code that went in was was uh, done a little bit differently. There's some changes to it. So it was actually kind of a bad thing to get there first because then we kind of had to go back and redo it the way that Bitcoin did it so that we can keep rebasing off Bitcoin. So anything that's going to Bitcoin, it almost makes sense to, like we know is going to Bitcoin, it almost makes sense to kind of let it get there first. Whereas we can take the more experimental things uh, on. So something like Simplicity uh, that's going to definitely hit elements before it would ever hit Bitcoin. That makes sense for us to get it in here and, and revise it and have that go through. But for something like Schnorr, it almost makes more sense to wait on Bitcoin in this case. So I don't, I don't think we're trying to race them. Uh, we don't want to have to do it twice. I'm still going to make the meme. <laughs> but, um, you know, speaking of simplicity, like... How far along is that going, really? Because I have not uh, really had the time with uh, how fast autistic nerds are building shit lately to uh, check in on that. Yeah, so so actually, um, one of the latest things we've done with it is um, made forks of both Bitcoin and um, Elements that supported, uh, you know, simplicity. And so one of the things that... Um, uh, Dr. Russell O'Connor, has, who's, who's our developer, who's, and and uh, that's, that's working on this, he um, you know built some signature verification things in Simplicity and and optimized them with what's what's called a JET, which is basically a, a way that you can optimize the code, optimize the code, but still prove it was the same thing as this really uh, slow but easy to verify um, program. So 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 like it's proof like it's conceptually possible right now. Um, right now, I think there's a lot of tooling that they probably would need to be um, built for, for it to be usable by kind of even above average developers. There are, um, but I am su surprised. I've seen, you know, a few people pop in and get it running and get it working and ask questions and know what they're doing. So it's starting to kind of expand. So I think we, you know, realistically getting getting it in is one step and then getting the tooling so that, not not just like normie developers can use it, but but even like the frontier type developers use it is a little bit more time as well. But we're aiming to get um, simplicity into into liquid, uh, you know, within the next year. Oh, that's a lot sooner than I would have thought, actually. Huh. Well, that's something interesting to look forward to. Yeah, don't 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 come back at me in a, in a year from now, and if if I if we miss that, but it's a kind of a you know rough target if we can get that in there. But we've again we've gotten. Um, we've gotten the proof that it can work and it's just a matter of, uh, you know, doing the polish and getting things ready and getting a deployment policy, you know, like a deployment policy so it can be done and included in an upgrade. And of course it's competing with lots of other things going on in liquiding, which, you know, obviously dynamic federations is, is like the big focus of the team right now. So, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of things competing with each other, but it's not as far. I, I was shocked when I heard it was possible to be that soon as well. So, um, it, it's, it could come faster than you think. I mean, it'd be a nice surprise, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of plumbed out as far as stuff that I wanted to get into. Uh, you know, Chris, Janine, you guys uh, have anything you want to dig into a little bit? I don't actually have to say, sorry. I apologize for my autism. Stop using autism as a pejorative. It's just a descriptive statement. <laughs> isn't, isn't that what uh, Craig Wright does now? Blame everything on autism? Y yes. Yeah, and it's so annoying because, I, I mean, this is off topic, but I, I find it, com like, if anything, if you're going to blame something on autism, his his reaction should have been the opposite. Like, he... I don't know. I feel like if I was in a legal case, I would be combing through every bit and piece of evidence and statement I've made as thoroughly as possible before I make it uh, to make sure that there's no contradictions and no gaping white holes. And so for him to say, oh, I, I missed all of these gaping white holes because I'm autistic. It's like, no, actually, I think it's if you were autistic, it would be the opposite. You would have 
you would have actually caught some of this stuff before you published it. I resent the underlying comparison between me and Craig Wright. I, I think we all I think we all resent it. Alright, you know, um it would be remiss of me to not take us out in an immature and trollish matter. Um, oh no. So Alan, will you please apologize to all the Ethereum developers out there for daring <laughs> to fuck something up once that didn't actually result in any money being lost? They deserve an apology. Well, I mean, I think this goes beyond the Ethereum developers. I know you were, you're trolling here. Um, yeah, I mean, like this whole system, we need to be, I, I, I think we've gotten more um, criticism for, for basically how we've dealt with it more than what the problem was. So, yeah, I think this is a good lesson for, for Blockstream in general is, you know, we have, uh, we've been around a while, but having, you know, production products out there outside of green has been, been kind of new. And I think this is a, uh, a good wake up call for us to, to, to step up our game on, on, you know, involving more people, involving the Federation more, uh, making sure everything we've said in the, uh, on all our documentation is, is accurate and, and reviewing it and reviewing it, reviewing it after changes are made. So there's, there's a lot we can, we can do to improve. And, uh, definitely we didn't intend to mislead anyone on any of this. Um, but it's much better if we just have everything cleaner and, uh, concise and are, are open about, you know, what, what is there and what isn't. So, um, yeah, definitely, a, definitely an opportunity to improve, um, I'm really glad this, you know, didn't, you know, we, we haven't had anything um, that's resulted in, in monetary losses. And that's something we're, we're really careful about as, as being kind of one of the first uh, principles we have is that, that, that no one's going to lose money uh, during the situation. It's, it, it's that it's recoverable. It may be hard. Um, there may be outages, but it's better to be down than, than, um, uh, losing money. So, so this, this whole system is intended to be hard to change and, um, hard to update and hard to modify, uh, with the intent of protecting people's money, which is, I think our, our first principle. Yeah, that's a, it's a fair, uh, statement with which to ruin my attempt at trolling, but yeah. <laughs> But, uh, I'm on, I'm honestly glad other people are looking at this now. So I think that's that's really good. Uh, you know, it was something where it was you know just us. We have our own monitoring and stuff, but um, more and more people giving attention to Liquid and and even if it's just to try to you know attack it or, or make you know identify problems. I want it, it's a good thing. That's how we're going to get better, and that's how we're going to find these problems, and and, it, and how it means that liquid is actually something uh, that is worthy of someone trying to come at. So uh, I, I look forward to to more of these, uh, more of this kind of analysis. Uh, again, if uh, I do re recommend responsible disclosure, and uh, we have uh, on uh, on our box your website, if you do find any kind of problems or is there anything like this, uh, please report it to us, and and we can we can uh, go from there. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you know, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it, Alan. Um, even with kind of having to put you on the spot about everything, uh, I think this was fun. As a less, as a less note, uh, I don't know if it was mentioned earlier in the conversation, but um, if I remember correctly, it was James Prestwich who originally uh, found the problem. Is that correct? Yeah, he was the one who first publicly reported it. So, it... just wanted to mention. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, uh, you know, yeah, thanks. It was fun. I hope everybody found it interesting. Later, Etherites. Ciao. Bye. <laughs>